Um, thank you very much for coming. It's nice to see all the seats filled. It's really cool. Um, so it's also great that we actually have uh, two systems in play right now that we can look at. And of course, front and center is um, Florence, which is still inland. And uh, those of you who've been following all this have already probably recognized the fact that as it was pointed out, you could have walked faster from Wilmington to New York, Carolina, to Columbia, South Carolina, than this storm has traveled in. It has been an epic crawl uh, for this particular system. Uh, um, amazing uh, <coughs> from a meteorological perspective in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. We also have, as a little, you know, some, a little bit of a twist and something different, but we have Tropical Storm Helene in the eastern Atlantic, which just kind of passed near the Azores. If you don't know where the Azores are, they're in the north central Atlantic, it's a group of islands, um, somewhat isolated. I believe they're part of Por uh, they're part of Portugal, and they are even with our latitude, but they are 30 times 60, 2,000 miles east of us, and before you get to Europe and 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 uh, Spain and Portugal. But Helene is now got an arrow pointed straight to Ireland, and uh, we'll be making landfall in southwestern Ireland as a as a post tropical um, cyclone, but a cyclone nonetheless. It'll do. It's going to do that late tomorrow. We can take a look at. We're going to take a look at that as well. Uh, I have uh, on my YouTube channel. I actually have a lot of people that watch from Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England, which is really amazing to me. You know, you you. you, you we're in a world now where everybody can see you, obviously, and, and it's so cool to think, oh my God, I have conversations with people um, people from, from, from uh, Ireland and from England. And in fact, last year when Hurricane Ophelia was going on, uh, they put me, they piped my YouTube because apparently weather information in, outside of their, local, their weather services there, which is nothing like what we have. Our weather service is amazing. The stuff that you have available to you to use <laughs> as tools and for information is, is astounding. Our government does a great job with that. It's really important that we keep the National Weather Service intact. Uh, the, in Europe, it's a little less the case, and it's hard to get the specifics. You know, they, they kind of, they, they don't get into the, the weather part of it as, as, uh, as in detail as we do. So that's another good, good plus. Um, the... The thing with Florence is, there's a couple of very notable things about Hurricane Florence. Uh, coming off the African coast over two weeks ago, uh, at, the, at the onset, uh, it, it appeared that this would be typical of some storms that come off that, the African coast. Some of them march across and become problematic. M more of them stay out to sea. And this one was starting to move with a northerly component fairly early, so it looked like it was going to stay way out, but there were things going on in the Atlantic at the time that led you to believe that maybe that wasn't going to be the case. Florence uh, was the, um, the there's a there's a lot the the latitude that you kind of look at when you're in the Eastern Atlantic is 20 degrees north, which is parallel to runs right across um, that line of latitude runs across. Um, oh, that's not good. <laughs> All right, hold on. I did. That was the one thing I did forget to do. All the stuff we had to plug in. Forget it. That's that's great. You need a couple of double A's. But no, I'm good. You know, Joe, they say paranormal activity drains batteries. Stop it. <laughs> Maybe if you want to get into <laughs> oh, no, we've already had that conversation before you came in. And I'm plugged in. Okay. Kicks, uh, quick, uh, kick save and a beauty. I'm just going to make this radar a little bit bigger because I don't need to, you don't need to see me. That is the current radar, by the way. And if you look, there is actually a tornado warning that popped up, two of them. You see those red boxes? Uh, so those are tornado warnings. I'm going to freshen this up, see if they're still there. And at least one of them still is. So even though the storm is where it is, 
uh, it's uh, you still get clobbered in parts of southeastern North Carolina. All right, so back to Florence. There is a, a point 20 degrees north, which is parallel to Cuba, uh, once across Cuba, just north of Puerto Rico, you know, that whole line of latitude. When a, storm, when, a, when a storm gets north of 20 degrees north, before it gets to 50 degrees west, usually they tend to be fish storms, and they, and they stay out. Um, this one, this hurricane, going back to 1951, was the first storm in its position when it was north of 20 degrees north and 50 degrees west. It was the first storm in that position to hit the United States. Uh, there have only been nine storms there have been nine storms in that box. I have to go back and look specifically at what the parameters were inside the box that they used. There were only nine storms in the last so, almost 70 years that became hurricanes inside that box, that box area, and none of them have ever hit the United States. They've all stayed out to sea. So this was the first one to make it all the way across. And we had unusual uh, things going on in the upper atmosphere that allowed this to have a... Um, a westerly component of motion for a long period of time. Just want to fix that satellite a little bit so you can see it. And there's the radar. The other thing that was remarkable to me over the years, forecasts of hurricane track have gotten better and better. And in this particular instance, the error <clears throat> The mile error of the landfall at, 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 on the 48-hour forecast was two miles. Two miles. That is astounding. You can make really good decisions if you've got a confidence that uh, we are going to see a landfall. You know, they give you a forecast 48 hours out, and it's off by two miles. That's awesome. Irma was actually also a very good forecast. In the margin of error, there was 20 miles, all right? Um, which, considering the fact that that was a Category 5 as it moved across northern Cuba and then made the turn over the Keys and came up into Florida as a, as a, as a weakening 3, uh, there was more variability going on. There was a much tougher forecast with that because of the subtleties in the atmosphere that were impacting it. Uh, they seem to be less, this seemed to be less of the case with regards to Hurricane Florence, but the forecasts have gotten really good from that standpoint. Intensity forecasts, on the other hand, and the Hurricane Center will, has admitted to this. I had conversation with the head of the Hurricane Center last year. We talked about this particular issue. The, the one, the, uh, the, where they're having problems, they're still like working on it, is the intensity forecast. Um, there were, um, it, it, there's a lot of stuff that the atmosphere with tropical cyclones that they still don't have quite a good handle on. So the, they have a tougher time with the intensity forecast, particularly in instances where these storms decide to just blow up into these major cyclones. Sometimes you, you, sometimes you look at them and you see that conditions are really favorable for development and something doesn't quite work out right and it doesn't happen. On the other hand, we've seen instances where conditions are marginally favorable for further development or for strengthening, or perhaps it looks like it's going to gradually strengthen, and they wind up exploding in terms of intensity. And we saw that in, in Florence's case, and it was, a, um, it was something that, that was, uh, they, was, was emphasized way too much in this particular instance. Everybody got folk, uh, Everybody in media got focused on the wind. The wind is 100. The top winds are 140 miles an hour. Now they're 130. Now they're 120, 115, 105, 100. Um, it's weakening. It's a dud, uh, it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So two things. Wind was not really the big issue all along. Storm surge was the big issue. And when the wind in the hurricane decreased, it de decreased for a specific reason. The storm itself, you'll notice how big it is in terms of the cloud shield. As it approaches approach the coast and as it's moved inland, but particularly as it made its approach to the co coast, and this is typical of storms, once they get out of the, the tropical region and start moving through the subtropical region and eventually getting further and further north, they tend to expand, okay? 
You ever watch a figure skater? When a figure skater, he's got his arms out and he's spinning, you'll notice that when he's spinning with the arms out, the spinning is slower than when he's spinning or she's spinning with his, their arms to the side. Okay? And that has to do with all the laws of physics, which we could go on forever and ever, but then you, you'd be like, I'm not sticking for this. But the, the thing is, as the storm expanded, the top winds came down because the pressure gradient it became less tight, so it, it spread out. But the area of gales, which is more important in this instance, expanded. It went from being a little over 100 miles from the center, gales being 34 knot winds or higher, uh, and it went out from being 100 miles from the center to 200 miles from the center in both directions. So now you have a net increase of over 200 miles where you're experiencing sustained winds of up to 50 knots. The 50 knot wind shield, uh, uh, the shield of 50 knot winds also expanded. And the hurricane force winds expanded to where they were getting sustained hurricane force winds out uh, almost 100 miles from the center. Same thing happened in Sandy, by the way, when Sandy got further and further north and it grew geographically into a bigger and bigger storm uh, as it became less tropical and more uh, non-tropical. When I say that, I mean more like a winter type storm, which are usually very big storms in terms of geographic size and impact and in terms of the wind field. So now you got all this wind that's suddenly blowing over a large area of water. The expansion of the wind field in Florence was particularly problematic because on the north side, you're coming into an angle in North Carolina. The North Carolina coast, if you see it here, is on a 45 degree angle, okay? Uh, you've got a storm, norm, usually most storms that impact North Carolina are coming up from this direction from the south, and they're moving. And when they move inland, they keep on moving. Usually as they move inland, they move even faster. So you know what, if you're, if you're experiencing this as a minimal hurricane, uh, you're saying, you're, what you're going through, you're, 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 you're thinking, okay, so I'm going to have maybe about um, 18 hours of weather to deal with. Maybe six to eight hours of that weather is going to be really insane. And then after that, it moves along. You get the wind shifts you're going to get which uh, of direction. Uh, if you are, uh, say, if you're on the North Carolina coast, anywhere uh, right from here. Let's say we're talking about something going in between Hatteras and Wilmington. All right, so the storm's approaching. You've got an east wind. It makes land. You get the storm surge. You get all this other stuff that goes on. You have landfall. You get the rain, obviously. And then the storm goes by to your north. Your clockwise winds around the low. So when you're on the south side of it, now you've got a west wind. So if your water came in with the storm surge, at least you've got the wind now in the opposite direction to help move it out. The storm is moving. It rains. You get heavy rain. Maybe you get 10 inches of rain. Maybe you can get 15. But it stops. Okay? It does eventually stop. The storm moves along. Now it goes into Virginia, moves up the coast. Maybe it impacts our area. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, but it keeps on going. This was not going to be the case with, with Florence. This was... Um, well advertised, but unfortunately, a lot of people got too wrapped up in the wind, uh, the wind speed dropping. Big mistake, big mistake. Uh, the outcome um, led to bad decisions, I'm sure, by as obvious from what we've seen by a number of people uh, that should have left and did not. I can't tell, you know, people ask me the last week. Should I leave? Shouldn't I leave? I can't answer that question. I don't live in your house. I don't know where you are. I don't know your geography. Even, you know, for here on Long Island, I, I, I can venture, a, you know, an idea and say, look, I think you have to weigh the possibility. This is what we have. But you've got to make the decision at the end of the day. Uh, I can't really make it for you. The weather service is going to tell you what they think you should do. And the Hurricane Center is going to suggest what they think you should do. A lot of people here um, didn't go, uh, it's going to turn out how many people were going to hear stories of, I stayed and look what, what I went through. And it's sad. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, you know, this is not the time to say this is something you brought onto yourself. You know, I can understand, as I said earlier, we all have the emotional attachments to our home. It's very, very difficult to do. But you got to, at the end of the day, ask yourself, you know, 
what's more important here and, and I can fix all this. It's all place. You then you have a family. Stay, get your you family know. safe. Yeah. And you try. There were a few sad stories too about folks that had there was one story I heard in particular of a, a gentleman whose wife was, was ill and he couldn't couldn't leave her, you know, when but he came down. Have, but they had ability to get, you know, you're gonna have to use, you know, you gotta it's gonna be frustrating if you God forbid it ever happens. You, there are uh, services that you can contact. Get, you've got your weather information early and you've got it from a reliable source, you can get ahead of the curve because everybody's gonna wait till the end. If you know ahead of time, you know, if you're in this room, okay, there's there's probably a huge probability there's a huge probability that all of you will be ahead of the curve. And I don't have to worry about that, which is a good thing. So uh, Florence, unfortunately, was coming in. And this leads to biggest mistake ever you could make when it comes to, with respect to tropical storms, and when it comes to the decision, okay? Um, and we touched on this unless you came in late, so this is gonna be a little repetitive. Uh, but uh, I went through, fill in the blank, storm name, and nothing happened, or it was okay. Therefore, I will stay home for this storm because it didn't happen the last time. Wrong. In 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 North and, and by the way, that will also apply to Sandy. Uh, to the in, in that the next one that comes up here, and there will eventually be a next one. It's been six years really since we've had a direct hit. Uh, our long term average is about a hurricane every eight or seven or eight years to come and directly impact uh, our area. Um, the next one, depending on where it is, maybe the land, this one, the landfall was in Tom's River, New Jersey. We saw what that happened. That's different from Hurricane Irene in 2010, which came ashore as a tropical storm in Brooklyn. And that created a whole, or South Queens, and that created a whole profile of coastal flooding that was different from Sandy when you look at the entire New Jersey, New York, Long Island area. So if you made the decision in Irene, depending on what, if you were in New Jersey, for example, and you said, well, Irene came by here and nothing happened, so I'm not leaving. That was a huge mistake, okay? Uh, there will be people the next time for a storm where maybe the storm the next time around goes inland over central Long Island and comes in on this, along the line of the Sagna Coast Parkway. You're going to have people that were in southwest Suffolk County on the shore and east that are going to say, well, um, it happened last time and it's close. I need to get out. Okay. And then you're going to have some folks west of there that are going to say, you know, maybe um, I don't have to get out for one reason or another. Uh, the, the point is that it's, it's never the same twice. A lot of people that I heard in conversation with respect to North Carolina said, well, Hurricane Matthew two years ago came by here and nothing really happened, so I stayed because, because of that. Totally different. Totally different. Was, they're two different storms coming from two different approaches. Uh, the storms themselves, two different characters. Um, and the profile of what has, the outcome is uh, totally different. So I'm going to run, let's run through some, some stuff of what's going on. And we can start with the uh, radar. I'm going to bring this up uh, full screen. And let me make sure, yep, my folks are seeing it fine. Um, got a couple of my Patreon people are on here. So uh, Scott Briller and Fallen Angel uh, are on at the moment. So anyway, uh, let, this is the wide radar view uh, that you're looking at. But I'm going to, I've got the tight radar view here. And as we said on the recent radar, this is the radar, by the way, out of Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, you've got the green boxes. Those are all flash flood warnings. And the coastal boxes that were up in northeastern North Carolina have finally come down, but they've been up for almost two days. And now we have uh, a lot of flash flood warnings up across uh, eastern South Carolina and interior North Carolina. They're getting... Uh, they, they, the rain, as the storm has finally started moving further west, the rain has been gradually spreading uh, westward uh, into uh, North Carolina. So maybe you question Please, by all means. Uh, here's the, uh, I'm going to bring up the wide view. And there we go. 
So there's the wide view. This is the current radar showing the rain shield. The part that's over North Carolina, except for a few places in the coast which seem to have stopped for now, is basically been like that since um, since Thursday. Since uh, the western part has finally has gotten into it, uh, <coughs> started getting into it uh, later on Friday. But there are a large chunk of that in eastern North Carolina, four days of nonstop, unrelenting torrential rains. Uh, we've had 30 inch plus amounts. By the way, while all of this was going on um, in the setup for all of this, I cringed so many times this week when, and I'm going to openly criticize, uh, I, you know, uh, the governor of this state and the governor of New Jersey. Uh, you know, I understand that politicians basically have a job to CYA, cover your, you know what? Okay. Yeah. Um, you had them saying things like, um, you know, epic storm for our area. Strong winds, heavy rain, severe winds, heavy rain. Flo tidal flooding, um, and I, Governor Murphy in New Jersey particularly used the phrase collateral damage, okay? It's just as important to get the correct information out to people in areas to let them know that it's not going to happen. It became very clear early last week we were not going to have to deal with this in the way North Carolina uh, was going to deal with this. In fact, it's the reason why it's doing what it's doing is why we have had such a great weekend, especially today with mostly sunny skies and temperatures in the low 80s and, you know, a good beach weekend. Even this, the waves were going to be rough and the surf was going to be rough. That can be easily communicated for those of you who want to go to the beach. But that happens in the summertime and other conditions too. But why are you telling people that something is happening when it's not? You know, I... I understand that you want to use it maybe as a point to tell someone, say, maybe this is a good time to just make sure you've got all your stuff that you need to have just in case. That's fine. But uh, you can do that without making something up with respect to what was going to happen here. I applaud the governor of the state of Pennsylvania because the governor of the state of Pennsylvania, when they have weather stuff that goes on like this in Pennsylvania, with, not with hurricanes, direct hit from hurricanes, but... Uh, with respect to heavy rain, and there's been a lot of flooding in Pennsylvania this, this summer because of some of the heavy rains that they've gotten there during the month of August. Uh, there were places in parts of uh, around Lancaster, Hershey Park, those areas that uh, the water is still hasn't gone down yet. But when he does a press conference, he does it with the state meteorologist with them. And if they're doing a press conference and the governor says something that's not correct from the weather standpoint, the weather guy's right there to interrupt them and say, uh, Governor, let me clarify what you just said. And he's perfectly okay with that. He'll, he even says, you know, if I say something that's out of line, jump in and, and, and do that. We don't have that. Call your local National Weather Service office. It's gov you know, state government and federal government, I know. Sometimes there's issues, but, um, you know, you can call them and say, hey, look, what's the deal here? Can you have a representative down for this press conference we're going to do so that you can give the weather part of what's going on? Because I don't feel comfortable um, giving the right information. It, it, it just hacked me off because it makes my job harder. Then I'm trying to, then I have to explain to 100 people what you heard, it's wrong. Well, they're saying it. How come you think you're right and they're wrong? You're wrong. Nothing's happening here. So, you know, it's needless. You don't need to do that. Uh, but there's uh, Florence. Thank you, by the way. There's Florence moving inland very, very slowly. Our issue is going to be with this is Tuesday, Monday night and Tuesday. What remnant low from Florence, the remnant circulation is going to try to come up the Appalachians, and then it's going to turn east, and we're going to get into some of the rains. My concern with this with respect to the rain was that if you wind up taking, usually what happens is when these storms move inland, um, you get them to move up. If they move east of the Appalachian Mountains, 
they can have a big impact here rain-wise, where we get um, we can get a rain event of size, three, four, five inches of rain really, really quick. If they go east of, uh, west of the Appalachians, they stay weaker. We might get some rain out of it. I'm leaning toward the idea, because this looks like it wants to move along or just west of the Appalachians uh, tonight and tomorrow, in which case we'll get some rain here Monday night and Tuesday. Some showery rains will go through. There probably will be some heavy downpours. It might be on the order of maybe a, a couple of inches, some locally higher amounts, uh, but that should be it. The only concern I have is that if the core circulation is still intact, if you're seeing, um, if, if you look on the radar tomorrow when it's up further north and you're still seeing the spinning of it, the, the, the circulation is still seems to be intact, then um, it's quite possible that if, depending on how that moves, whoever gets underneath that, could get very heavy rains for a few hours and maybe there'll be some you know, extreme amounts in some places. I don't think that's gonna happen here on Long Island from what I saw. Um, I'm about 85% sure about that. Just wanna leave a 15% window just in case, but um, I'm allowed that. Um, and also, at least from the standpoint of how you perceive the information, it's always a good idea to expect some fluidity. There's gonna be, there's gonna be shifts, there's gonna be change, you know, we've been at this for years. I've always, um, I've always had a tough time understanding, trying to understand why people seem to expect certitude from me. Because if you haven't gotten it by now, you're certainly not going to get it at this very moment. Uh, so, uh, you know, try. People need to kind of expect a little bit of um, uh, fluidity in the forecast that the, that there might be changes, and there might be positive changes, there might be negative changes. Um, if you're prepared for that. Nothing would nothing should surprise you. So Florence uh, on on uh, on the radar. Here's another local radar shot. And what I want to do is I hope the Wilming the uh, Moorhead City radar was down. This is the Blacksburg, Virginia radar. The rain is moving uh, into Western Virginia uh, and West Virginia, and this is of concern because uh, it's not totally well known. Uh, it, it, it didn't get as, as much play. But this area in Virginia, in Western Virginia and in West Virginia, in the Blue Ridge Mountains this summer, uh, many areas picked up six times the normal rainfall. And most of that fell in the month from late July to early September. And when I say six times in terms of an actual number, we're talking uh, all in some places, almost a year's worth of rain in three months. So uh, the ground is is completely saturated. The rivers are full. Uh, there was a story back at the end uh, during August during one of their rain events where the Lynchburg, the dam in Lynchburg, was about to burst, and it didn't happen. But they don't need a six to ten inch rainfall, and they may very well get it. Uh, we're not seeing these are these are total rainfall amounts so far. Yes. Sure. Yes, it still is because part of the circulation remains over water. Okay, so when it hits, it hits the Appalachian Mountains, and I'm thinking to California and the Rocky Mountains when a storm comes in, California gets the rain, the other side of the mountains turns into desert. Correct. So how come they're getting east of the mountains? East of the mountains, they're, they're getting an east wind. In California, when the storms come in, they get California, Washington, Oregon, it's a west wind coming in off the Pacific, right. loaded with moisture. So you get you get the orographic effect from the mountain. The wind goes up the side of the mountain. All the moisture is wrung out of it. So on the west-facing side, you get um, deluge with rain and snow, yeah. huge amounts of rain and snow. Right. Once the, 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 the flow goes over the mountain to the other side, there's no moisture left. Or what little moisture is left gets dried out as the wind goes down the mountain, down slope. So all the moisture gets taken out, and as you said, the result is on the other side, it's usually bone dry. Reverse direction of the wind here. You've got a storm that's to your south, you have an east wind. So you've got wind coming in off the Atlantic to the mountain. Up, the wind goes up the mountain, all the moisture gets wrung out. It's the same thing that's happening in the, that happens in the Pacific, except it's backwards because the wind is coming in from the east here. Our ocean is east of us. So the wind is coming from the east, hits the mountain, goes up, and it gets wrung out. So it's not the, it's, 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 
No, it, it's not. It, it, the actual circulation is east of the mountains. Here, look at the wide. Let me go back. I'll just show you. The mountains are the west are twice the size of what's there. And that's the other. That that exactly. That that that's also the other thing. Let me put the the loop up again. Hang on one second. Um, I'm showing you. You know what you're seeing here is. Come on, load. I can't believe everybody's trying to get. I'm in the Greer, South Carolina. So we're at the bottom of the Appalachians here. You see all the rain? I'm pretty far west with the radar. But when you look at it on the wider radar view that I had, uh, this view, whoops. No, that was not. That's for later. Let me put that back over here. Uh, so here's your, here's your view. Your storm center is actually down here somewhere, OK? So you're getting wind coming from here, all across North Carolina, all across Virginia, but the low's still here. So this is all going to get drenched. If the low tracks up this way to eastern West Virginia or western West Virginia, it's going to track just along or just east of the mountains. And you're going to have that, that, um, that orographic effect with the rain east of the mountains. West of the mountains, you won't get so much. It'll be backwards. If it goes west of the Appalachians, You'll get some rain east of the mountains because you're still going to have that east wind, but it won't be as strong. The fetch won't be as strong because more of the energy will be to the west. So that's the concern about the mountains, and particularly for the central Appalachians, if you wind up with a low to the east, this rain is all going to translate up this way. Do you, do you get where I'm going with this? Yeah, I'm just thinking that it, it's going past, but that way seems to me it looks like an infrastructure storm. Yeah, I think he was asking I mean, uh, how is it making it. Oh, well, it's not as high. The Appalachians are nearly as high. They're about half as high. So, so some of it's going to survive. Uh, some, of, some of that rain is going to survive on the west side. But uh, it's not like uh, all yeah, of it disappears. But the vast majority of it, what you're going to wind up seeing is a tight gradient between who gets an inch of rain and then who gets six inches, depending on how far west it goes. So there'll be a, kind of a, 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 a fairly rapid decline from the maximum rain to, uh, to to much less rain. Looks like okay. Northeast Tennessee is getting harvested. Yeah, there's some of the bands are making it into Northwest Tennessee, and and that they're close to the circulation, so they're going to get something. The mountains are going to also work to disrupt this even more. The friction from the mountains is going to take apart that low level surface. This storm, by the way, you know when you look at tropical systems, they're 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 built this way. In other words, they're stronger near the bottom, near the ground. And they're weaker at the top. The higher up you go, the weaker the system is. Uh, it's warm core, so all the energy is at the bottom. The uh, a cold core wintertime systems in reverse, where it's usually strongest the higher up you go when you look at winds and everything else, and weaker. You can have a really really strong winter storm if you look at it. But when you look at it, the upper atmosphere is usually a powerhouse. Go to the height of the mountains and take a look at the Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So. In terms of the rainfall from this, which was ex exceptional, that's the Weather Service's latest. I think this was the latest forecast. Let me update. This is at least for the likelihood of uh, flash flooding in that area. So there's a high risk of flash flooding again today across all of North Carolina into western Virginia, and there's a moderate risk going north of there. Obviously, we don't have anything here. This is only through, um, uh, this is going to be take us through Monday morning. So very important to you. Make sure you check your dates on these maps that you look at so you know um, the right, uh, you know, exactly what you're seeing. I, I wanted to go back. I just want to look at the, uh, just to, we can look at the total rainfall amounts. Here's the radar from Columbia, South Carolina, the current radar, just absolutely loaded with rain uh, when you go to, to the uh, northeastern part of the state, moving northwestward. And let's jump. Hopefully, we'll get to this. will give me the Wilmington radar. Yeah, okay. So let's hope it's working now. It's loading. So they're still getting some big, there's a big squall that just squall uh, right here that's moved inland near Wilmington. And I just saw, I noticed a, torna a, a quick tornado. You look really fast as that red box just pops up and disappears. So there was a tornado warning that went up and probably lasted for all of about 10 minutes. Uh, but you're still getting tornadoes being produced out of this. The rainfall, the storm total rainfall here, and unfortunately, Wilmington decided to cut off the first half of the storm. So this is actually rainfall 
since 11 p.m. Friday. So this doesn't count anything that fell on Thursday to 11 o'clock Friday. So since 11 p.m. Friday, the purple is 15 inches. The dark purple, there's a small stripe of dark purple, 20 inches of rain since Friday night. And counting, they're still not done. And we still don't know, and, and this doesn't have the numbers from Thursday into Friday. So there's 30-inch there's amounts in all of this. And we'll look at the, the radar. The one I was hoping is working, and it's not. Uh, uh, Moorhead City, because they were running the rainfall back to um, uh, uh, till, to through before landfall, so it was a total. But we do have Raleigh-Durham that has got a storm total from Thursday, from just about landfall. The white is all 15 inches plus. It's, but even up at Raleigh-Durham, they're in the darker reds, which is 5 to 8, 5 to 10. And now you're starting to get the heavier rains going more northwest and toward the mountains. So all of this is going to, you're going to see these amounts double and triple probably before uh, it's all said and done. And, you know, that was, again, with respect to the flash flooding uh, that was um, uh, anticipated, the uh, potential for flash flood. All of this, by the way, available on the Hurricane Center website. This is the rainfall forecast that you can also get. You'll notice that we're in this green area, which is basically one to two inches. Uh, ending uh, Wednesday morning, so by then it's long gone. Uh, this two to four inch band that the uh, Weather Prediction Center, that's WPC, uh, is forecasting for upstate New York and in New England because the low center, according to them, looks like it's going to go further to the north. Uh, the rainfall for the Western Carolina into Western, Western Virginia in the yellow, they're going for four to uh, eight inches. Four to ten. Well, the yellow is four to six, and the brown is six to ten. So you can see the heavier rains, and I'm sure this is going to be updated uh, even more. And this is additional inches on top of what's already there. Okay, so this doesn't count what's already fallen. Now, uh, here's a wide view, by the way, of the tropics, so you can look at what's happening. And the good news is, at least uh, we are about to enter maybe a little bit of a breathing time. Uh, the tropical Atlantic is relatively quiet. Whatever's out there seems to be very weak at the moment, which is good. Helene is on the upper left. Uh, Florence is inland here. In Texas, you had a upper air system and a tropical wave that got together late last week and produced some heavy rains uh, in uh, parts of uh, south and southeast Texas, and that has moved westward. I have a viewer on my YouTube channel from Oklahoma, uh, Oki AG. He's got a big farm in Oklahoma, and he was thrilled because they've had a drought where he is. Uh, they got very, they've had very little rain in the spring and summer, so he somehow managed to get about an inch and a half uh, of rain, and his grass came back to life, so he actually had to mow his lawn. So he was thrilled. Uh, but it looks like we're going into a period of quietness. The, the, this here, the rem, uh, in, in the Central Caribbean, we have the remnants of Tropical Storm Isaac, which uh, fell apart because of strong upper air winds, which kind of sheared it away. And out in the Atlantic, the only one thing I'm just kind of giving a side eye view here is this, this weather that's northeast of, of Puerto Rico. Uh, out, uh, it goes out about uh, three or 400 miles. Uh, some of the models were trying to spin up little systems out of this. Um, some of them weren't. I'm not too concerned, but I just... Given the time of year, it's always wise to just sort of keep it, in, you know, keep a little side eye and make sure you check it every once in a while that nothing comes out of there. The European model yesterday was trying to do something with it, not on a major way, but uh, enough of a way where uh, it would have suggested perhaps another round of tropical rains for the Carolinas um, sometime later this week. But then again, then it went kind of backed off from that. But it is something that we want to uh, take a look at. John, it looks like the wave coming coast of Africa, you just, just see the piece of it right Yeah, there. you kind of, like at the very, very end of the frame, you, you can sort of see that little south darkness south there. Line. So that might be a wave that comes off. I, I didn't see the models really do very much with it uh, for, um, but, you know, in the longer term. But we've got the new GFS out, so we can actually look. This is one of the models that we use. The weather models actually didn't do a half bad job with this. Uh, they all had problems with uh, Florence, especially with the final track. But the Hurricane Center did just an absolutely fantastic job with uh, going, filtering through all the noise uh, with, with, with respect to this. 
And um, I, I can't commend them enough. When your error is down to two miles, that is a, um, a good thing. So I'm going to put up the upper air because I, I can go back three days and kind of show you what's happened. Why, why did this happen? Storms up here don't usually stall. They usually do move and keep going. But there was a very unusual situation here. Normally here in the east, we have a fairly active jet stream um, where we have uh, stronger winds moving around either from west to east or like we saw in, uh, in late July and through the middle of August when we had all those rainy systems and those endless days of cloudy weather when it wasn't raining. Uh, we had southerly winds along the east coast and norm uh, the upper atmosphere. Normally, hurricanes like to hook onto those southerly winds and just kind of, you know, do what they're supposed to do, which is move and keep on moving. This was different. Instead of being controlled by low, lower pressure and faster flow, it was being controlled by higher pressure and weaker flow in the upper atmosphere. So right here, it represents Florence. Right here is a big upper high. And if you look at it, it's like a kidney bean. It cradled. Do you see the shape of it? It has it cradled. It basically is a kind of a, a wall where the hurricane, at this latitude, hurricanes want to go north. The spin of the earth makes them want to turn and go north. So that unless there's an opposing force to kind of push them this way, um, they're going to want to just keep going north and northeast. If that ridge, that upper high was weaker, Florence would have turned northward and then probably moved on northeastward, passed offshore from us, maybe would have come a little closer, but more than likely it would have moved up and out. But this high was really, really strong, and it just basically kidney beamed it and forced it to go to the Carolinas. This was three days ago, by the way. Now, what happened is the upper high splits in two. You've got high pressure on one side, high pressure on the other. See those lines in the upper left? That's the jet stream from Canada. There's no flow of air to speak of in the upper atmosphere up and down the east coast. It's just nothing. There's the winds, upper air winds, you go to 18,000 feet, you would barely find a, 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 you know, the winds are very unusual, very, very light. So there's nothing to push it. So you wanted those westerly winds to come down, those southwesterly winds of the upper atmosphere in Canada to come down and kind of get it out of here. It's not going to happen with the big upper high underneath. So Florence now is forced to the coast. The high splits in two. One here, one here, Florence here. No flow at all, completely trapped. This happened last year with Harvey, very, very similar situation. It's a little more common to see it down in the latitude of where, where Texas is, because they're deep in the subtropics. They, I mean, they're deep in the subtropics and the tropics nearby. The upper flow in the summertime is, is relatively weak in the, high, in the upper atmosphere. So it's not unusual to see something like this happen for, you know, that far south. It, it, it doesn't happen very often, but it's not that unusual. You get stalling storms all the time the further south you go, depending on what's happening. In this case, uh, here we are in North Carolina. It splits, it's in between those two, and it's not moving. It's got no, it can't move. And it just kind of inches its way. Eventually, that upper high to the west strengthens, kidney beams around it a second time, and starts to force it inland. See it right there? See how the upper eye just kind of builds there over Missouri and Illinois, wraps itself around it, and now finally, as it comes all the way around, you're starting to get Florence to move. Here's the representation. It's also a weakening. And now you've got the winds in Canada finally dropping down. So uh, we can move it along and say goodbye. And, and that is that is why the upper air, the, the, the upper air steering, the reason why we had um, the outcome that we've had. And this is what it looks like on the uh, surface. This is what the new model today is saying. So there's your low. Uh, this is for 2 o'clock this afternoon, which is in th 13 minutes, uh, in northwestern uh, South Carolina. 
Uh, it, the GFS wants to take it to, you know, at this point, you don't see where the L is printed, but it's right about here, which is Eastern Kentucky. That's kind of borderline. Well, you know, it's, it, it looks like it wants to be west of the Appalachians. By Monday afternoon, uh, it's somewhere in southeast Ohio. You've got rain maybe into central PA. A little bit of that rain gets into northern New Jersey tomorrow night, maybe just some lead showers. And then it swings eastward to the coast, and we get into some rain on Tuesday. Looks like it may want to try, you know, if that the front, there's a cold front that's going to be trying to come through at the same time as the low goes by. And that front may try and get hung up. There's a second low that forms here. This is Wednesday morning. So there might be some lingering clouds Wednesday. And finally, we can have some get rid of bad hair weather uh, by the time we get uh, to Wednesday. And then going forward after that, that's a quick shot of dry air. Looks like it'll get warm again at the end of next week for a day or two. Another front comes by and then a stronger shot of cooler, drier air for next weekend. Nothing crazy, but just to let, at least to let us know uh, where uh, that autumn is not that far away. Any questions before I go on to uh, Helene? No, what's the bad hair weather? I don't understand. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, neither do I. And mine is its natural color every other week. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So you know what? We can move on to uh, Helene. Uh, this is a visible satellite view of Helene. The reason why this is dark is because the sun is set, so we can't actually see the clouds. We'd have to go to an infrared satellite, which I'm going to do in a second. But the, Helene is this swirl that's out in the uh, Atlantic here. And uh, it, it, here's Ireland, and here's England, and they're pretty far north. Uh, it's not often that they see tropical systems come up that way, but every once in a while, uh, there are a number of them on record that uh, make the trip. And this one is making quite the trip. Actually, Helene never got west of 40 degrees west, and then just kind of turned straight north. On the heels of that, right in here, that's Tropical Storm Joyce that formed. They're very, very close together. And when you look on this loop, Joyce is kind of rotating around it. Joyce actually moved southeast and now is moving east. It, it's it's there's a, an effect when they get very close called the Fujiwara effect, uh, named after Mr. Fujiwara, who found this. I'm, not, I'm serious. And it, it's kind of what happens. If you take, um, I know that these days, unless it's on a video screen, it's not necessarily considered a game. But if you think back to the days when we used to spin tops, okay? So spin a top, spin two tops, and watch what happens when they get really close together. They, if you watch them, they'll get really close, and then they'll sort of pull apart a bit. Uh, that is the forces that the tops are generating while they're spinning uh, acts as a a sort of a repellent, and one what might essentially rotate around the other. That's kind of what's happening here. That is what's happening here with respect to the Fujiwara. Sometimes what happens is the, the, um, the stronger storm will absorb the weaker one, although there have been instances where the weaker one absorbs the stronger one, depending on how the setup was. Last A uh, couple of years ago when we had Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Nicole very, very, very close together, they were less than 500 miles apart. Uh, at one point, ultimately, uh, Nicole actually wound up absorbing Matthew, while you know, but, and Matthew was the straw uh, at in the formative station uh, stages. Matthew was a Category Four hurricane, while Nicole was um, a, a, a developed into a tropical storm. But eventually, Matthew got weak enough where Nicole took over and and wound up absorbing it. But this one is uh, heading uh, to Ireland, and we can actually see it. Because if you go to a website, if you're weather, you know, if you're weather geeky, uh, you can uh, look at, uh, use the website tropicaltidbits.com. Uh, it's a wonderful website, and all of this is free. You can see all the weather models your little heart desires, and uh, you can look at maps from all over the world in terms of what the weather's going to be like. Plus, he's got all kinds of other stuff. The man who runs this site, Levi Cowan, uh, is a uh, a grad student at um, Florida State University, uh, where uh, he's uh, 
doing his graduate work in tropical meteorology. And he really knows his stuff. He go, I, I've learned so much from him with regarding to, to uh, the intricacies of the tropics. And he puts, does videos on YouTube as well. And he puts them on his website. So if you, you know, if you're interested in, in, in like getting an understanding of how tropical weather works, um, he's, he's great. So Helene is actually this system up here. Joyce is this system down here. This is our Florence. And if we look elsewhere in the tropics, there really isn't too much uh, at the moment. So the model is forecasting Joyce to basically separate from the, the impact of Helene. Helene is actually being influenced by this storm that's up near Iceland. And it's inside that storm circulation, but it maintains a separate identity. Now, we're, this is, by the way, tomorrow morning, noon Ireland time. Uh, this is uh, 8, 8 a.m. our time. Uh, the storm is at 48, 48.9, 14.1 west. And that is actually not that far from uh, the uh, uh, northeast, the northwest coast of France, which is right there where I got the cursor. This is Portugal. This is Spain. And by uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow night, Ireland time, uh, we've got uh, uh, Helene on the coast of Europe, but we can get tighter on Europe. This is a great way to go to Europe and not have to pay, pay airfare. Uh, but here it is on today's run. It's a tight little low that maintains its identity. It also is gradually going to get absorbed by that North Atlantic low, but by six o'clock tomorrow evening, it looks like they'll probably be getting gales along the south coast of Ireland. And I'm going to switch to a map where you can see the wind field at the surface. So this is the ground wind forecast. So the yellow is basically the yellow is all gales, 30, uh, 34 knots or higher, touching the south coast of Ireland. So weather conditions there will be deteriorating through the afternoon and evening. The land wind impacts don't look to be too serious, but there's mountains in, on, in Ireland. I don't know the climate. Uh, a few of my uh, audience members have explained along the way that there's all sorts of weird wind things that happen with the Atlantic storms uh, where some places will get, uh, you know, 40, 50 mile an hour wind gusts once you go uh, away from the coast. And then that moves out. And then there's another gale center. This is not a tropical system, but a system that's going to be moving off the coast of Canada or southeastern Canada and run across the Atlantic pretty rapidly so that by Wednesday, uh, they're going to be hit with what looks like a more powerful storm. Uh, the winds here in the reds are all 40 knots or higher sustained. Not the gusts. These are sustained winds. So gusts are going to, could be much higher for the west shores of Ireland and uh, the west shores of Scotland. It's actually quite nasty uh, on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday noon time in uh, western Scotland offshore. It looks like 50 knot winds or higher. So that's going to be one powerhouse scale that they're going to get behind um, Helene. Not unusual to see these things uh, go on, um, and like I've come, to, I, I've gotten a, a very, I've actually, uh, I've learned quite a bit over the last year and a half, two years, because Europe is not, a, we really don't pay too much attention to that. But I started getting people watching from Ireland. They were watching our weather and kind of getting fascinated by it. And then Ophelia forms, and I said, you know what? Let me start dedicating. I'll dedicate some stuff just specifically to that. And I, the reaction was great. I, 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 was, I was totally floored about, by it. Today, by the way, is the anniversary of the 38 hurricane. It is 80 years ago today. I was just in, I wasn't even in utero yet. I wasn't even a concept. Okay. Uh, the 38 hurricane, imagine going back to a day there's no Facebook. You might want this. There's no Facebook. There's no Twitter. Um, there's no. There's no television. Um, early in the development uh, phase, there's no. Uh, there are no weather models to speak of. There's no weather channel. Um, there's no weather channel. There's no. no What's that? Probably no homes on Road here. Oh, there were there were some. No, no, there were actually quite a few. Um, so you're at a time where 
You don't really know what's out there in the Atlantic. They didn't know what was. They didn't know what was out in the Atlantic. The only way they knew was if there was a storm that maybe say impacted the Carolinas, and the weather people, the weather service, you know, was able to see it. They might have known that there was something way out offshore. And remember, uh, you couldn't turn the TV on. If you turned the radio on, it was highly unlikely that you had. I don't even know if there were any old news channels in the day, but it was a different world. Uh, you knew that there might have been a hurricane out there because the fishermen, when we had the large fishing industry here on Long Island, the fishermen would come back and they would say, hey, you know what, looks like there might be, and you, you would use their very valuable experience of years of being out in the ocean and being able to understand the weather of, uh, and, and what certain things would tell them with regards to the wave action and everything else. So unless fishermen were coming back in and, you know, reporting that, that, that there was something out there that we needed to be careful of, you were really just pretty much had no clue. And that, it would, if it were ever to happen today, which it, it, it just won't, this is, you know, 2018, this is not 1938. Um, there's no way a surprise hurricane is going to show up out of nowhere. Uh, not, you know, it's just, it's just not. And... It would be hard to fathom how you wouldn't need, how, how you would not know about something. Uh, I often wonder, you know, when with some folks, um, with certain weather events, because of everything that that you know about stuff is you know is is going to be on the page um, ten days in advance because people are already hyping it up, and when you get close to an event, you'll you'll inevitably run into. I didn't know this was happening. It's like, do you live in a hole? I mean, do you really live in a hole? Are you completely isolated? How did you do it? I wonder how many hurricanes they missed then. Actually, that did not know. Well, um, still don't sure. Know. Well, look what happened this correct. year back in June when we had Hurricane Beryl in the Caribbean, which was basically the size of a cluster of thunderstorms. Uh, when they didn't have satellite, uh, you know, we're talking about a storm that was a hurricane that, that was literally 50 miles wide. Okay, 50 miles wide. And the uh, extent of hurricane force winds went from basically here to the Long Island Expressway. That was it. So uh, unless you saw it, on, and when you saw it on the satellite, I've seen clusters of thunderstorms that were bigger. Um, one of a uh, weather guy that I follow, cranky weather guy, he calls himself, and he's up in New England. I love him. He's really, he's very good. Um, I hope so. Well, you know, I... Uh, he uh, he called it severe thunder shower barrel because it was so tiny. But yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff got missed. So who knows what the right numbers of, uh, of uh, tropical storms and hurricanes per season because there wasn't satellite. The satellite era changed everything uh, as far as uh, hurricane forecasting is concerned and about as far as hurricane observations are concerned. That map you see there, by the way, is a weather map from the um, from 1938, that shows you can Google all this stuff. It's it's all on there. But that's what a weather map. That's probably all. Somebody like me in 1938 wouldn't even have access to this until it was printed, and you had to order the magazine from the government like weeks later, uh, and you would get the book. That you would get the delivery uh, of a, of a magazine. It was like a monthly. I think it was a monthly, and you would just, every day, every weather day, there would be one weather map showing what the surface looked like. But that was the 38 hurricane on its approach. It was a Category 3 uh, at landfall, one of only two Category 3 hurricanes that uh, made, have, have uh, directly hit uh, this area, the other being Hurricane Carol in 1954. Um, and th th we've had a smattering of ones and twos. And uh, because of where we are and the interaction of other elements in the atmosphere that make these storms change a bit, like we saw with Sandy, um, a one or a two under certain circumstances could cause huge problems. So it's really important, you know, the, the category numbers of these storms are useful, but uh, it's, as we saw even in the case of Florence, uh, the wind uh, is the, the criteria for category is wind. Uh, it used to be wind and pressure, which is what I like better, uh, but they went to strictly wind, and now we have run inevitably into an instance where that category number was kind of meaningless because you may have made a decision based on the category number, 
not taking into account the impact of rain. And I wonder whether they should revisit these things when it comes to get, getting close to the coast. Maybe they need to look at, okay, what's the impact number? Because we're talking, maybe we're not talking a big wind event, but we're talking an epic rain event as being more. Or maybe it's both, like it was with Harvey. So you might want to raise the, the emphasis on a, on a ranking for a storm that, that you think is going to have impacts of both wind and rain as opposed to one or the other. Or maybe it's wind and rain, but it's on a smaller scale. So the, the category numbers is, is, uh, is tricky. That might be something that the Hurricane Center might want to think about uh, revisiting uh, down the road. Do you know what that storm peaked at or they don't know? Uh, the highest measured wind at the Blue Hill uh, Observatory in uh, Massachusetts, no, in Eastern Mass. Out. Uh, in fact, I, it, it, it did reach on the 20th of, of September. Now, I'm wondering why in the name they're making today the anniversary of the 38 hurricane when it's actually the, it's actually between the 21st and the 22nd. Okay. I wonder why they do. Everybody this morning, I'm watching all these things. It's the anniversary of the 38 hurricane. <laughs> why? It's the anniversary of the 38 hurricane becoming a hurricane. That's Maybe why. that's why. All right, now I understand. So it's not really the anniversary of the landfall. It's the anniversary. I have to remember it, and i got to dig deeper when these people come up with these things because they're wrong. So it was a Category 5. At the point when it was east of the Bahamas on the 20th, it reached Category 5 status. So they had to know from the Bahamas how to be affected. They knew they something, was, something, was, something was out there. Yeah. Now... Uh, whether they had enough uh, forecast information to, to, to tell them that the storm was going to move straight up the East Coast, I don't know. Um, but uh, certainly they knew that the hurricane was there because it passed very close to the Bahamas, and there were ship reports that they got from this when it was out in the Atlantic. So this was not a, a surprise from that respect. Notice that from the 20th to the at late afternoon of the 21st, this thing rocket shipped almost 2,000 miles. Okay, it was moving at landfall at over 60 miles an hour. There was a very, very strong southerly wind in the upper atmosphere to do that. And the issue, if you were on the east side of the storm, you not only had to contend with the strength of the storm, but you actually, you also had to contend with the momentum of the storm moving. So if you're, if you're on, a, if, if, if your storm is, if, if you're on the east side of a storm that is moving at 60 miles an hour, and let's say the highest measured sustained winds are 100 miles an hour, you're going to get gusts to ridiculous numbers, 140, 150, maybe even 160. Brief gusts wouldn't have shocked me. And that's what happened on eastern Long Island, on the eastern part of Long Island. Uh, and as a result, uh, there were, I believe, a dozen inlets that were new inlets that were cut, including the Shinnecock Inlet, which did not exist until the 38 hurricane. I don't know if anybody's been to um, um, St. George's Manor off the William Floyd Parkway. If you're a history buff, there are three places I think you should go to uh, that are just, you know, very, very interesting from their historical perspective. Uh, one is um, St. George's Manor which is off the William Floyd Parkway on the right as you're headed towards Smith Point Park. It is a, uh, a home, a manor that goes back before the Revolutionary War that was built by one of the founding Long Island families. Um, I don't know if it was the strong, I'm, who's, I'm trying to remember because I've gone to three play, different places like that and I'm going to mix them up. But there was the Floyd family, the strong family uh, was involved in all of this. Um, the Nichols um all the famous roads on Long Island and the Smiths, et cetera, et cetera. That home goes back to before the Revolutionary War. There was a, a battle in the Revolutionary War uh, that uh, uh, played a, there was a big key role they, for the defeat of the, of the British uh, uh, there uh, and, and the Hessians that fought for the, for the British. And the role of the home and the family with regards to that uh, <clears throat> battle in the Re Revolutionary War. Uh, the um, second home, the reason why I bring that up is because uh, there's an inlet there that was carved, that was closed due to the 38 hurricane. There was an inlet 
that was open on the South Shore near Fire Island, that the 38 hurricane closed while it opened the, created the Shinnecock Inlet to the east. The storm passed in between the two. So there was a north wind on the, on the side where the William Floyd Parkway is. And then you go a little bit further east toward West Hampton, and there you had a south wind because the storm passed in between them. That inlet was closed. Sandy reopened that inlet. And one of the things that it did, as the people there were telling me, was that uh, over the years, that part of the bay, a lot of the water got very stagnant because there was no fresh access to fresh, uh, fresh ocean water to come in with every tide. So over the years, you had a lot of stuff that collected uh, and made the water you know, murky, algae, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, fish life was impacted, marine life, um, clams, shellfish, all the rest of it. When the Sandy opened up that inlet and allowed for fresh Atlantic water to come in, that basically cleaned that all out. All that water got cleaned out. And, it, and, and now um, you've, the fishing has improved. The water has gotten completely clear. It's kind of like nature's way of just kind of flushing everything out and, 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 it, and it cleaned that part of the, uh, the bay up. Uh, the other place you should go to, by the way, is on the other side. While you're there, go to the other side of William Floyd Parkway and go see the William Floyd Estate because the two kind of go together, uh, and it's a good place. And the other place, by the way, if you ever get a chance, because I got to do this and it was it was terrific, was um, Sagamore Hill and Oyster Bay Cove uh, to go to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's home on Sagamore Hill. If you've never been there, it's like I felt like I, when I was in that house, I literally felt like that family was still there. It was just it was, and it seemed like such a fun place. It was like, I wanted to be here. But I recommend all those three places. But the 38 hurricane, you know, did a huge impact. This is the track off the African coast, went, went straight west, avoided the Leeward Islands in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, turned to the north, became a category five. Then uh, it weakened to a three, quote, weakened to a three, makes landfall. The acceleration of the storm prevented this from weakening further. If you want to look at the track of Hurricane Gloria in 85, they were almost identical up and even until where its strength, how it strengthened, because Gloria at the same place that the 38 hurricane was a category five also became a category five. 915 millibar pressure, which was, at, uh, I think it might still hold the pressure for the, the uh, actually, it's not too far from the vicinity of where Irma is, was. So, Probably not, but up until Irma, it was the lowest pressure ever observed in the southwest Atlantic. But the difference was that when it came up the coast, much the same way, it didn't have that strong southerly flow like the 38 hurricane. So it came up very slowly, relatively slowly, only at about 20 or 30 miles an hour. Once it got north of Virginia Beach, the ocean is colder. Uh, it spent uh, more time over it. And it weakened. It weakened to the point that after it made landfall close to the same place as the 38 hurricane, though people, uh, many people have, have said to me that you know, after it came in, in on land, there was no south side. The eye, the center came through, and there was very little weather on the other side. There was, not, there was a little bit of wind, but it wasn't anything to speak of. There was, very, there was hardly any rain because the storm was in the process of falling apart. So the character of the storm changed because of the fact that it wasn't able to uh, accelerate. And if you go to, hopefully I didn't, here it is. I think this is it. No. Um, I know it's not these two, but let me just pull it up for you. This is the Hurricane Center's website, by the way, which I want to uh, uh, remind you about one other tool that's very useful for those, for those of you who have uh, coastal issues. But... Uh, if you go to nhc.noaa.gov, if you have never been there, I, I knew you would be. <laughs> uh, if you've never been there, uh, this is what the page looks like. You'll get a map showing all the active systems. Joyce is now weakened to a tropical depression, it seems. Uh, that's the circle. And, uh, it, you know, it really doesn't look like it's going to, you know, that's not going to be any problem, hopefully, for anybody. Helene, at this point now, with the X, is post-tropical. Florence is here, so it's inland. 
and also uh, weakening. And actually, they've already, the Hurricane Center is not even issuing advisories anymore. The Weather Prediction Center is uh, now that it's inland. And this is the remnants, what represents the remnants of, um, of uh, Isaac. Uh, but I'll come back to this in a second. But going back to the 38 hurricane, I had the page up, and I must have I, I must have accidentally erased it. Um, but if you go to the Weather Service website, uh, okay, here we go. So if you go to the New York office of the Weather Service, there's a a, a great separate page, uh, all on the 38 hurricane. Which is called the Great New England Hurricane of 1938 because the impacts to Rhode Island, uh, Eastern Connecticut, Rhode Island, Southeastern uh, Mass were even uh, stronger than what they were over us. And there are pictures here. Uh, they tell you the highlights for Long Island. Ten new inlets formed from the storm from Fire Island to East Hampton. The most notable was Shinnecock. A few others have since been filled by artificial means. Okay, Montauk was an island temporarily. Uh, the um, LIRR tracks were wa washed out. The fishing industry was wa uh, wiped out, and half of the apple crop on Long Island um, was gone. Um, the other half now has been taken over by folks from Manhattan who come out uh, in, a, in, in the fall uh, and, and pay 25 bucks for a bag of apples. I miss that. I used to love going when I first came out here 30 years ago. Uh, I loved going out there with my kids in the fall, and you just can't do it anymore because it was a well-known secret for at least a little while. And now it's just John, you know everybody where the water does it. Went, like Montauk and Island? Um, where they cut? They I don't know where the cut. I guess a cut. Right? There's a, I don't know where that, the cut was. Small strip there. It could be. It could very it's well have been. It went to Montauk. Yeah, it's, it's probably. Mem, you know, yeah, Mem. it's probably where it was. But uh, Amagansett, whatever. East Amagansett. Amagansett. Yeah. Uh, now the damage in dollars was six point two million. That's in 1938 dollars. Uh, remember that obviously we adjust for inflation, and also, which is that number is not obviously, but uh, also the infrastructure there was probably far less than what it is now. Uh, the values of the homes are far less than what they are now. Uh, so I imagine if you had a similar uh, repeat performance, uh, we're talking, you know, many billions, and a lot of upset New York City people. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but it just drives me crazy. Uh, the daily, the top winds in New York City, by the way, New York Cent uh, Central Park, 60 miles an hour from their wind tower, 30 feet up. Um, the Empire State Building, 120 miles an hour, but that's up over a thousand feet. And Battery Park, 70 miles an hour. But those winds were coming from the northwest. So there wasn't uh, any kind of tidal impact. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> lowest pressure on Long Island was 941 millibars. That is, uh, Sandy was at, in the 940s also, 944. So the pressures were very close, but the 38 hurricane was able to maintain its compact nature, whereas Sandy wound up becoming extra tropical and spreading out the way it did. Uh, and 120 mile, mile an hour, um, maximum sustained winds at the time. So that is that is a, thir a landfalling category three. And there's the line on the track for Long Island, just basically cut the island in half. Uh, amazing. The total cost of the damage in um, for everybody was $620 million in 1938 dollars. So that would be the equivalent of $41 billion using 2005 inflation, wealth, and population normalization and then estimated to $2,010. Peak storm surge, 17 feet in Rhode Island. Uh, 700 people lost their lives. Peak wave height, 50 feet at, at, Gloucester, uh, at Gloucester, Mass. 63,000 people left homeless. That is a serious event. And thankfully, that is a generational event. One other thing I want to leave you with, because we've got a little time afterward. Uh, they'll, I don't know if they're going to kick me out at 2.30. You probably won't, but um, one other thing uh, to remember as far as uh, nhc.noaa.gov is concerned, and unfortunately because the storm is inland, we can't. I can't show it to you, but if we get a storm, remember this. 
when you go to nhc.noaa.gov, you're going to scroll down to one of these menus that lists everything that the Hurricane Center is point, putting out for their particular storm, for a particular storm. You've got wind speed probability, arrival time of winds, wind history, warning cones, and interactive map. Um, this is really kind of cool uh, because if you pull it up, you can, uh, now I'm only going to show you, be able to show you Helene because that's the only one that's relevant, but you do have an interactive Google map that you can zoom into and it shows you their forecast and how it's impacting your area. So if this were a Long Island threatening storm, you can zoom in and see, well, okay, here's the center. Well, how close, it, how close is it really uh, to my house? And then it'll put on more cities as you get closer. We have uh, Cork on, in Ireland, um, Usmore. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce all of this. A lot of this is, I need my Gaelic buddy to... to, 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 yeah, to what is it? Let's call the flow. Yes. Um, Yo Yo Yogel, Dungarvan, Kilcarney. So you get the idea. You can do this for us. Now, if you continue on the menu, if there's a threat to Long Island, if we're under a hurricane warning, there's going to be a second row of options. <clears throat> on the second row of options, there'll be a map called Storm Inundation Tool. That is really a great tool to have because if you're on the coast, you can use that. This was not available at the time during Sandy. This was recently added uh, last year. And it was uh, useful for Irma uh, when it made landfall in the United States. But you can use the inundation tool. You're able to zoom in, take a look at um, uh, Long Island, specifically your area of the South Shore, and it will tell you how many feet of water can you expect on your street how many feet of water above ground can you expect on your street? South Shore residents, make a note of that. Uh, it, is, um, it is a real good thing to use because it's and every time a new forecast comes out, every six hours, with whatever changes have been made in the forecast, is going to impact the surge that's on the storm inundation tool. So you can go back and look at it six hours later and say, okay, the forecast changed. Here's how it changes by flooding. Maybe it changes it. Maybe it makes it worse. Maybe it makes it better, but at least you'll know specifically for your point what's going on. It's not available. There's another tool. There's, but no, this is specifically designed. It's a hurricane storm surge. Let me just real quick just give uh, Ben a couple of minutes to just say hi. Uh, so say hi. Just tell hey, me. Yeah. I'm going to sit right here. Okay, you're going to sit quietly? All right. I, but that's all right. All right. <laughs> Anyway, I'm a New York City police officer, and I'm a special operations, and one of the things that we, that we focus on besides the scary stuff that we had to go through, we do a lot of rescue stuff, and uh, I originally went to school to become a meteorologist, and uh, drunk driver changed that, but uh, you know, that's, that's another story. Um, I've worked inside of Irene Hurricane Irene, I've worked inside of Hurricane Sandy, so I know what the people in North Carolina are going through right now. And we actually sent 100 officers down there to help out with, uh, with FEMA 1. So they're down there right now conducting rescues and doing what, what I did back in the day in Irene and Sandy. And uh, I, I can just imagine what they're seeing. But um, as Joe said, we're, you know, things are bad right now in North Carolina and, and that area. But we're, we're, we're seeing a little break right now in, in the action. And, uh, and we'll see what, what late September and uh, October brings. And the biggest thing right now is going to be watching the old fronts that come through and stall out because a lot of times you get something, a little surprise at the end of the front. And then uh, the lower Caribbean, something that might enter the Gulf or, or come up through like, like Sandy did. I'm not saying we're going to get Sandy, but you know, those are the realities. It's, it's not over yet, but we're going to have a little bit of a break. And, you know, each year, you know, we, we play this game every year. We were very fortunate in the 70s and 80s that it was quiet and, and I think people got, got used to that and they think the world is coming to an end now because it's, it's becoming more active but we're still Joe I think we're down about 38 percent from, uh, from the 1890s through the 1860s 
uh, in terms of landfall and hurricane. 1890s to the 1960s. You to the 1960s, I think we're down about 38 percent. Yeah, I mean, and that, and those are sick, and those are cyclical things. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, so absolutely. Now it's starting to get a little bit active, and people think that oh, it's, it's know, never it's been like this before. Yeah, never We've never seen. Well, you haven't been alive and, long enough. And and as Joe said, we were talking about satellite data. Was the first satellite was 1961. Uh, no, it was past that. I think it was 66. Okay. Was it 61, Leon? That's what we had. I guess because I'm almost 60 now, I seem to forget anything with that number on it. Think about it. We have 57 years of satellite data. Even in the beginning, those satellites you know, didn't have such a wide angle. Compared to a 4.5 billion year old Earth. So when the media says, oh, we've never seen this before, this has never happened before, I guarantee you it's happened before, but we just... We just don't know. We don't have a picture of the 1938 hurricane, what it did. Like, we don't have that data, so we don't know. We're, we're, we're still learning about weather, and we're still learning about nature, and we're still learning the structure right. of storms and what they do. And, and, and uh, we, you know, the fact that the... The fact that the intensity part of the forecast is something that the Hurricane Center has admitted that they have problems with yeah. and, and still do. And they may probably will have problems with for quite a while. Yeah. But it goes to, it, it begs to how much we know and how much we still need to, we're, we're going to be learning. And that's a positive thing. I also think, and um, it's my never to be humble opinion, uh, going back to what we, we might have missed this at the very beginning because we were talking about the mainstream media and the wonderful things that they do. Uh, but, um, you know, I happened to see yesterday uh, the predictable, this is all about climate change. And the, my response to this is, there's a time and a place to be doing that. This is not the time and place. Right now, we are on search and rescue mode. We are on storm mode. Save that for afterward. There might have been very valid. I watched, actually watched some of the piece. There were some interesting things about it. Um, it's, I, you know, I always try to absorb and learn. I don't have, I keep an open mind on things. Um, and, and that's a very politically charged issue now. So I have to be, um, you know, I, I try to be careful uh, because of the fact that voice, they're listening to me. And I'm referring to Facebook and a few other insidious things that have gone on in the last couple of months. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I, I can get into that because it's all actually quite funny. But uh, there's a time and a place for it. I don't think a, poli a, a story that has a political charge to it belongs on the air during a time when we're trying to save people's lives. Come back to this a week from now, two weeks from now, uh, because, but by then, the media will be distracted by something else. And, and, I, 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 and I understand why they're doing it now, because it's front and center, but you know what? It's sad because it, it shouldn't be. I went into that on my Facebook page, and it actually seemed like I, I lit the match and, and left. But <laughs> just, Earth, why not? I mean, the Earth doesn't know who the president is. Whether you like the president or you don't like the president, or the president before him and the one before that, Earth doesn't know who the president is. They don't care about Earth. Doesn't care about politics. Earth is going to do what Earth is going to do, and 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 no matter who's on the desk. The Earth's mechanics are not going to change some of these pieces. It's yeah. a very slow process, whether you believe in climate change or you don't, you know, whether you believe that, that humans are interfering with the atmosphere or not, it's a very, very slow process and it doesn't match in the day that someone gets it wrong. Right. And by the way, just for the record, I mean the earth the earth has warm. Uh, the data show it. The earth is warm. Okay. The problem is that I should be able to tell you, you know, from the data that's out there, what what does that mean? I honestly don't know. It's above my pay grade. These are very, very um, intricate scientific thermodynamics physics stuff. You open up some of these technical papers that they write, and you know all you see are, you know, are, are, are uh, you know old Greek mathematical symbols in long lines with pluses, minuses, parentheses, squares. And I'm looking at this, and you know some of it I kind of get, and the rest of it is so beyond my understanding. You know, these, this stuff is written for for people who have doctorate degrees. I don't have one of those. So, but but my point is that uh, it's the Earth has warm, uh, and it's also my view that look, we all you go outside and you walk on the grass, you're having the impact on the environment because of all the ants you're stepping on and disrupting their anthill. Okay, so it's kind of odd, hard to think that we don't have an impact, but we should be able to have a conversation. That we should be able to have a scientific conversation that is does not have a political 
where everybody's on gets on one corner, one side of the room, and one people on one side of the room, people on the other, they're all screaming at each other. You know, but we can't do that, and you know, these days it just can't be done. So um, we'll, we'll just sort of end that that topic right there. If, if you go back, them storms do that every year, but most of the time it's out in the ocean. Yeah, and nobody nobody gets this time of year. Um, so uh, the and after. They were right on it with Sandy, all right? What happened, what was the difference between the before and the when it actually happened? Well, uh, Irene was in 10 then, right? Yeah. 11. Yeah. 11. 11 yeah. Okay. So Irene was in 11. Sandy was in 12. Um, the When you say not getting hit, you talk about, are you talking about right before the storm in terms of, uh, of that? No, I'm talking about when they thought that was going to happen, and, and all remember they said they, they talked to each other, they weren't sure if that was going to happen, but everything, if everything came together. You mean with respect to Sandy? Yes. Okay, so, uh, and, and, and you're asking me, like, what was the difference between that and, and what's the other side of the... Then, well, then it, it happened, like, later. It didn't happen that same time, because my son had left. They, uh, they advised him to evacuate. He lived in Long Beach. And the first time he evacuated, and there was nothing. It was just a heavy rain, and there was nothing. I think she's talking about what happened with Irene and Sandy. Right. And, yeah. and then Sandy was a different story. And Sandy, yeah, and then when Sandy came, a lot of people, did, including my son, unfortunately, didn't believe that they'd really get hit. And he, he didn't believe it because the because, because I there. went through Irene the year before and nothing happened. Right. Yeah. Which as we said from the beginning is the biggest mistake you can make uh, when it comes to these storms because they are two Irene and Sandy, two totally different storms, two totally different approaches to the coast, two totally different uh, points of landfall, for example, so Irene came in along the south shore of was it was it Brooklyn or Queens? I forget. Yeah, but it right. Over Coney Island. All right. So it comes over Coney Island. Um, it was at the last day of August. Uh, I don't even remember what the moon phase was. If it came in on a full moon or a new we, moon. We got lucky. We got, we got lucky. It was in between moon phases. Yeah. Did it hit at high tide? Um, well, we had a couple of high tide sites. Okay. So totally different uh, from uh, from with respect to Sandy. Sandy comes in on a on a on a full moon phase, if I remember correctly, right? Comes in on a full moon. Uh, comes in as an ex and, and Irene was a tight, maybe more typical tropical storm uh, in terms of its geographic coverage. So its impact in terms of the geography, was not nearly as wide as what, what Sandy wound up evolving into. So you've got uh, a different type of storm. Uh, Irene approaches, the wind is south, the tide cycles are not uh, in a place where you're going to have, um, you're going to have some tidal flooding, but it's not going to be crazy as it happened. The tidal flooding in Sandy was, was more in, to the west, toward Jamaica Bay, uh, and, and, and in parts of South Queens, uh, and, and so on. Moves inland and, and goes. Sandy, uh, totally different approach because it came in from the southeast. It goes inland. Remember, we were talking earlier about that angle for North Carolina. So now you've got a storm. We've got an angle, too. We've got the New Jersey shore yeah, this way. Right. We've got Long Island this way, right? So, yeah. So basically, you've got Irene which goes up on a straight shoot south and south north. Keeps on going. You got your 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 your, top, your, your period that you go through. Sandy comes in. <coughs> so here's your angle like this. So Sandy comes in this way from the southeast. Goes into the New Jersey shore. We're on the side that's getting the east the uh, east and east and the southeast wind. All the water pour, pours into that perpendicular. And it, you know what? The, the fact that it went down in the central New Jersey coast was, was also uh, a big deal for us because uh, if, let's say, it had gone in over western, uh, like near New York City or, or further east, the angle would have, it would have been spread out more over the ocean, so the angle probably would have 
the tidal flooding profile would have changed completely. Uh, but because it went into the central New Jersey coast, you literally had this funnel that narrowed, narrowed it even more. So now you got all this ocean water that's pouring into this narrow funnel between where the storm is, the boundary of the of the southeast wind, like this. And it, it, it goes, it goes from it just basically shrinks it. So all of that water just goes in there. And also because I uh, Sandy made the transition to a uh, post-tropical cyclone. In other words, it wasn't truly tropical anymore. It starts to look more like a winter storm. The gales spread out, much like what happened in, with Florence. The area of strong winds, instead of being 100 miles or 150 miles from the center, are now 200, 300 miles from the center, even more in terms of gales. So now you've got all these strong winds over a larger geography of ocean. The strongest winds are much lower, but you've got, instead of having a tight belt of, of 75 mile an hour winds, you've got a 100 or 150 mile belt of 70, of 70 mile an hour, 75 mile an hour winds. Excuse me, Bill. Do you, do you have internet on there? Yeah. Can you do me a favor? Um, yeah. I want to show her something. And Go ahead. Uh, look up the 1893 hurricane. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why people are concerned about our news. And I'm going to type in uh, Hog Island. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, that, that might not. Uh, the 19, 1893 New York hurricane. All right, so we'll bring this up. See if they can bring up the track. Now this is why a lot of people, a lot of forecasters, were concerned about Irene. This was a Category One hurricane that took. And let me just bring it up full screen for everybody. Hang on, give me one second. There we go. All right. So that's the 1893, 1893 hurricane. hurricane. And, and a lot of forecasters were concerned because Irene was on a similar path. And right before, right before Irene went over New York City, it did a little dip into New Jersey. And it really cut the capability of Irene, but they didn't know if it was going to do that or not. Now, this hurricane here was a Category 1, and in Coney Island and in Seagate, they were they were reporting 40-foot waves. Now, imagine that. And this is why category, when you think about categories, it's, it's not important once they get into our neighborhood. But a lot of the concern about Irene was because of this storm, which actually erased Hog Island off the map. Hog Island was a resort island that was south of Rockaway and Brooklyn at uh, uh, the, the famous Tammany Hall uh, <coughs> mayors and, and all of them. Yeah, it's where you used to go in the... And there are still people that died on the remnants of Hog Island today because of China uh, and from, from the 1890s and everything like that. Where that's, was Hog Island? Hog Island was south of Coney Island. Yeah, there was a little two mile, uh, one to two mile island, depending on the erosion or or, uh, or how much sand was deposited on the. Well, you know, just for comparison, so you can look at this. This is this is the thirty eight. This I'm sorry. This is the um, uh, the eighteen ninety three hurricane. So you know what? Let me bring up. Here's actually a weather map of the time, actual surface map. It'll come up. I mean, talk about having. Little, you know, not a whole lot of information here. See, but. it went almost over the same area where it made landfall in Coney Island. But Irene did that little dip. And if you take a look, a lot of hurricanes, you know, you saw it in Florence, they tend to wobble on their general path. And that little dip into New Jersey really it saved us. And the fact that we didn't have the spring tide as well on top of it. Now you have. All right, so that's the 1893. I'm going to bring up. If it lets me. And the sad part is, is that a lot of people call Irene a dud, but there were a lot of people in the Great South Bay that lost their homes. And uh, they were. So her, here's Hurricane Sandy, just for comparison. So that track was similar to Irene, but I'll bring up Hurricane Sandy's track. Yeah. And the, the funny thing is, the 1893 hurricane hit at low tide and almost gave you the same. Surge as Sandy. It had it had a low tide and I think uh, 
Now there's the sandy track. Yeah. And you see that here it came in from the southeast, which was very unusual. And if you're in this zone, okay, so you're in, um, okay, it's already zoomed in. Nope, there it is. So here we are. So it's it's in this area here that's going to get the maximum flooding, of the coastal flooding. Put on top of that that you had a high tide and you've had, you had nine-foot surges that were reported. But that track going into New Jersey was, um, even though we didn't get a lot of rain, we got a ton of wind and a lot of tree damage. And of course, the tidal flooding was 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 uh, sig was hugely significant. And that's why you can't, you know how with hurricanes and, and say, well, this, this is what happened with this one. So we could expect this with this one, right? They're like a fingerprint for a lot of those things. You know? And I can tell you from experience, I was on a boat in Irene. Irene was the worst one. Irene was very, very bad. We rescued two people off of Staten Island when Irene was coming in. And when we came back to the base and we were telling people what we observed, me and my partner, we were, we were told liars. We were, we were told that, that we didn't see that. And that it's possible that we could see waves that big and only you know, 15 feet of water or, or whatever off Coney Island in New Jersey. And we saw what we saw. We knew what we saw. And then the following year when Sandy hit, the lighthouse that we named the, the rescue near uh, uh, Orchard Shoal, Old Orchard Lighthouse, um, was, was sheared off the rocks. That lighthouse was there for 100 years and made of wrought iron. And it was sheared right off the rocks. And it proved that we were telling the truth about, about what we saw and what's capable in that area. So, so it's, important, it's important to realize power of these hurricanes. And while you might you might say to yourself, well, this was a dud to someone else. It's, it wasn't a dud. You know, they lost the house and rebuilt and they lost the thing. So, um, and that's it. We're uh, good? I will flood Thank you. We're going to throw this out soon, I'm sure. Thank you. For, for, thank, thanks. Let me just say, just to wrap it up, thank you very much for coming. I really, really appreciate it greatly. Um, you can... Uh, Find my stuff if you're not on my Facebook page, meteorologist Joe Chaffee. Uh, ben uh, writes on nycweathernow.com. I'm on um, my meteorologistjoechaffee.com. Uh, if you're really, really weather geeky, you can uh, go to my Patreon page, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and uh, you'll get everything in there. If you didn't make it to the library, you can be watching it right now. You can watch it on YouTube. Plus, there's my YouTube channel. Um, you can uh, subscribe to that. That, that. that one's free. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I do live streams at least once a day. Sub in storm situations like this with Florence, I was doing, I'm doing double live streams, one in the morning and one in the evening. And if we get a threat, uh, I'll be living on there. So um, <laughs> thanks very much for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. What's that? Did you bring walking rocks with you? I did not. He only bought enough for two. No, just for the $10. Oh, my Nor'easter mugs. Yeah. No, I didn't bring any with me. No. Oh, but I got you cigars. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Now we talked about how to play the audio to get the name. Oh, really? It sounds like you know the language of it, so I had to ask a cigar friend. What is this? Oh, thank, thank you so much. much. <laughs> yes, thank you. I owe you. Yeah. Yeah. I owe you. I, owe you. I, owe you. I owe you. So who knows if some branch back in the
Hi, nice, nice to see you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. Let me just shut, let's shut down my Patreon stuff. So All right, folks, we're going to go. Thanks so much for being here, Scott and Fallen Angel. And anybody who's watching this later on, um, I hope uh, th this works for you. Take care.